full house today. Welcome to the daily briefing. I have three items at the top if you'll bear with me and then I will turn it over to Deb to open us up for questions. First, a trip update. As announced earlier, Secretary Kerry is currently in Kabul, Afghanistan to meet with Afghan leaders, including presidential candidates Dr. Abdullah Abdullah and Dr. Ashraf Ghani and President Hamid Karzai as well, uh, in addition to the head of the UN mission there. Secretary Kerry's meetings will focus on the current elections process following up on a, a trip he had there fairly recently, including encouraging both candidates to help accelerate the audit process that they are both participating in, to make progress on the details of the political framework that they agreed to, as I mentioned, during his last visit there. The Secretary will urge both candidates to continue working together to ensure national unity and continued progress in Afghanistan. Second item on Iran. I want to give everyone a brief update on the upcoming schedule for the EU P5 plus 1 talks with Iran on its nuclear program. As you saw in the media note we released last night, today Deputy Secretary Burns, Under Secretary Sherman, and Jake Sullivan are in Geneva meeting bilaterally with an Iranian delegation, uh, which is led by Deputy Foreign Minister Abbas Arachi as part of the nuclear talks. Our team in Geneva also includes Rob Malley, who's the NSC Senior Director for Iran, Iraq, and the Gulf States, Jim Timby, who's one of uh, the USG's uh, top nuclear experts and a senior advisor here at the State Department, and Paul Irwin, who's the NSC's Director for Nonproliferation. As you know, we meet with the Iranians bilaterally during the P5 plus one rounds in Vienna, as all of the delegations do, as well as separately from those rounds, as we did in Geneva in June, if people remember. These bilateral consultations take place in the context of the P5 plus one nuclear negotiations led by EU High Representative Kathy Ashton. Uh, I know there have been some questions about the role that Deputy Secretary Burns and Jake Sullivan will play going forward, as they are both leaving their current positions in the not too distant future. Given their history working on this issue, particularly with the Iranians, I can confirm today that they will both remain involved in the Iran negotiations as special government employees after their departures from their respective positions. Both Burns and Sullivan. Uh huh. In terms of schedule, we expect to hold an EU P5 plus one round of talks in September in advance of the ministerial meetings at UNGA at a location that's still being determined. We will also likely hold an EU P5 plus one meeting on the sidelines of UNGA as we did last year, if people remember, possibly with ministers participating in some way. The specific details of these meetings remains to be worked out. In the meantime, we will have bilateral consultations as we are doing today and experts meetings to continue working through the very complicated and technical issues that are a part of these negotiations. Uh, these few weeks right now will also, of course, uh, be a useful time for delegations to have serious conversations in their capitals, including, importantly, in Iran, about the path forward and how we can make progress uh, towards concluding a comprehensive agreement over Iran's nuclear program. Sorry, one? that was a long one. I have one more at the top. Can we get one clarification on that? Uh -huh. Just so the, when you talked about the EU P5 plus one meeting in September, mm -hmm. that would not include Iran. It's just the P5 no, plus no, one No, 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 that would EU? include Iran, a normal plenary round like we have. And at what level is that political I directive? just said the details remain to be worked out. And then They traditionally have been, these are more than one clarification. Got it. And then the one on the sidelines again. The last again, one, and then I'm going to do my last topic. The, the one on the sidelines of Anga would also be with Iran? Yes, Thank as you. last year's was as well. So just a quick wrap-up of the Africa Leaders Summit. Uh, I'm sure you saw the President's press conference last night. As he said, the summit reflected the reality that even as Africa continues to face great challenges, uh, we're also seeing the emergence of a new, more prosperous Africa that's being led by Africans. And important progress was made on a number of fronts, just a few of them I want to highlight today. And then I will open it up for questions. I know I get, I get the floor for the beginning here and can, and can talk for a little bit. Uh, I want to highlight commitments for $33 billion in new trade and investment, major new commitments to the Power Africa initiative to triple our goal and aim to bring electricity to 60 million African homes and businesses, new investments in people through programs focusing on health, entrepreneurship, and young Africans, among other things, an additional $4 billion in investments for Africa's development, including for support to maternal and child health and the delivery of vaccines and drugs, new investments in, Af in African peacekeeping and security initiatives to meet common threats from terrorism to human trafficking, and finally, opportunities to address good governance, including stepping up efforts to fight corruption and develop a new partnership to combat illicit finance. So I know there was a lot of activity here over the past few days, and I just wanted to highlight a few things we got done. Deb, it's okay. good to see you. How are you? Good. Um, Get us started. Okay, I'd like to start with Iraq. Uh-huh. Um, ISIL sees this uh, 
dam up in Mosul, and mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you all could put that in perspective in terms of um, you know developments there. Also, what can you tell us about the administration's thoughts about how to help these trapped Iraqi civilians, these uh, religious minorities mm -hmm. that are <clears throat> kind of in trouble? Are there some discussion right now about humanitarian aid mm -hmm. and whether or not that might include airstrikes or mm -hmm. what can you tell us about well, that? Well, I'll start with the dam and then let's go to the broader question. Um, obviously, the situation on the ground remains fluid, but the latest information is that ISIL has advanced on Mosul Dam. Uh, and taking control of it. Um, we are extremely concerned by this development. Uh, the dam is a vital part of Iraq's infrastructure as it controls water levels on the Tigris River. Uh, it is also a key source of water and electricity generation for the Iraqi people. So we are closely coordinating with the Iraqis, uh, with Iraqi officials in both Baghdad and Erbil uh, to counter this development, but also writ large, I just say a few points. I know there is a lot of interest out there on this today, a lot of questions and information floating around. Uh, we are actively considering what we could do in support of Iraqi efforts, what more we could do, um, and it, particularly to provide additional support for the Yazidis, also the Christian communities we've talked about. Um, look, this is a huge humanitarian crisis. You have you know, thousands and thousands of people at risk of death from starvation. Uh, we're reviewing what more we can do. Obviously, uh, we've talked a lot about this over the past few weeks. We're working politically with the Iraqis on the government formation process. We've seen some progress and hopefully we'll see more. But we are right now actively considering what else we can do given the extremely grave humanitarian situation that we see on the ground. Uh, you've heard my colleague at the White House who I think just talked about this as well. So we're looking at options. What about aid? What about helping the Kurdish fighters? The, the Peshmerga? Yes. In what way? Any kind of assistance whatsoever. Are you considering that? Well, we have a, a couple things. We've obviously worked with them a number of ways. I would note for people that we opened a joint operations center in Erbil, also one in Baghdad, but the one in Erbil works directly with uh, the Kurds to share information, to help them with this threat. Uh, look, we're reviewing to see what more we can do, um, but we're in consul constant consultation with both the government of Iraq, also with the Kurdish regional government about their requests for, uh, for assistance and what more we could do. But we've been very actively engaged, especially through our foreign military financing and foreign military sales in terms of getting military assistance to the Iraqis. You mentioned it's a humanitarian crisis. Um, mm -hmm. How soon might we know what kind of decision you all are going to make? Well, look, we know this is a very urgent one. I think the President does and the Secretary does. Uh, so I would expect to see, you know, I don't have anything to preview, but I, I think we all understand the, the urgency and would expect to see, um, um, you know, some decisions about what we might do coming uh, soon, but I don't have anything to preview. For like today or? I don't have anything to preview for you, In the Deb. next several hours, maybe? I don't have anything to preview for okay. you, Deb. You can keep pushing. Okay. Yes. Can we go back to the uh, Peshmerga uh, assistance <laughs> Sure, question. and then I'm going to you. Yeah, the uh, Iranian government had said, I mean, the Iraqi government had said that after a lot of back and forth about whether the U.S. was uh, doing any drone strikes on its behalf, that no, it was in charge of doing any strikes on ISIL targets. Is the U.S. in the process of providing materiel to the Iraqi Air Force so that it can continue providing cover and carrying out missions in tandem with the Peshmerga? Well, Raz, it's not new news or breaking news that we have been working with the government of Iraq and the Kurdish regional government uh, to figure out how to best confront ISIL. Uh, we've done that in part through foreign military sales and through foreign military financing. Uh, obviously, we know this is an incredibly serious threat, and the Peshmerga have played a critical role in addressing this threat. Uh, we have noted also that there's been good cooperation between the Kurds and the central Iraqi government on this. So right now what we're focused on, you know, we put these joint operation centers in place. Right away uh, we increased ISR coverage so we had more eyes on the ground in terms of what was happening in Iraq. We got, you know, DOD assessment teams out there to see how more we could help. So all of those pieces are part of a puzzle that right now we're looking at how we could do more, particularly given this incredibly grave humanitarian situation that's, well, that but, we see on the ground. But given that ISIL has taken control of the dam in Mosul, that has an impact on a large percentage of Iraq's population. It does. Where's the urgency in dealing with that problem? Well, I can guarantee you that there are a number of people working around the clock on this issue, including today. And again, we understand the urgency, and we're looking for more ways to help. And if we, if and when we have more details about how we'll be doing so, I'm sure we can have that conversation then. Yep, Margaret, and then I'm going to you. A uh, few questions. Marie, on the um, question of the Yazidis, do we have any estimate of the 
a number of people in peril? It's a good question. I'm trying to get some information from our folks on that. We know it's, you know, there. I've seen reports of 15,000. I've right. seen a number of reports. I'm trying to get a little more clarity from our folks, and let me see if I can do that after the briefing. We do know it's not just the Yazidis, though. It's also these Christian communities. I mean, ISIL has come out and said they have a desire to kill uh, people because of their sect or their ethnicity or their religion, and that they've been doing so. And so what we've seen on the ground is just really horrific uh, and that's why right now, immediately, we are trying to find more ways to help. And is, uh, policy-wise, is mm -hmm. stopping, you know, ethnic cleansing or f is fear of potential ethnic cleansing a core national security interest of this administration? I think you've seen throughout this administration that when we have the ability to prevent humanitarian crises or when we have the ability to help once there is a humanitarian crisis ease the suffering of people, through whatever means possible, right? We have a number of tools at our disposal. That has been a core principle for what guides our action. It's certainly not the only one. Um, and another question for you, given these meetings in Geneva that mm -hmm. have to do with Iran and the nuclear talks, I know, mm -hmm. but in the past there has been a precedent with Bill just, Burns just bringing once. up. Just once. I wouldn't once. call once a precedent. Well, it's had <laughs> once one. before. Yeah. Will it happen again? Will Iraq come up in these conversations? To my knowledge, it's, it, it will not. Obviously, I think probably people talk about things in the news, but in the way we talked about uh, two rounds ago, I guess, when we said it had been raised on the sidelines. To my knowledge, that's not planned for this round, which I think may now actually be over. Uh, people are headed back tomorrow. Okay. Well, yes. Oh, I'm going here. Uh, so uh, the, about Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, the, the region, it, this is the gravest crisis they're facing. And recently it was reported by the Washington Post that ISIL has just now controlled uh, even a town that's like less than 30 kilometers away from Erbil. I was just talking to friends and people in, in Erbil. They were really panicking. Mm -hmm. People are leaving Erbil. So people are asking in Kurdistan whether the America is going to really act mm -hmm. to protect its, it, like Kurdistan has been one of the most pro-American allies in the region. Honestly, there are thousands of posts I read on social media, everybody saying, is really America going to help us or is it going to save us? Because Kurdistan, just I, I heard the Kurdish leader talking on Amman Port show saying that mm -hmm. w the reason that we are defeated because we are having outdated Russian weapons and ISIL has advanced American weapons. Is there, well, is I, there I anything more ISIL than has statements? Advanced American weapons, but setting setting that aside, I can guarantee you that we are help. We are already assisting the Kurdish people and the Iraqi people, all of them, in their fight against like ISIL. In what ways? And we will continue to do more of that. We've already ramped up our military to military assistance. We've already worked through the central government. But part of that also has been working with the Kurds, particularly through this Joint Operations Center in Erbil that we stood up. We've had assessment teams on the ground. We're providing humanitarian assistance. But as I said, I can't underscore enough for you how uh, seriously and closely and urgently we are looking at what more we can do. Mm -hmm. And that we understand that this is an incredibly dire situation and that we are uh, in, a, in a place where we're looking at what we can do to help. I don't have any announcements to make for you or timing to guess about, but you know, I, I do know that we are looking very, very seriously at what else we can do because we do understand how serious it is. And, and the, about the Yazidis, more than like 60, 70 people have starved to, to, to death or have died mm -hmm. from thirst in that like dry mountain. And, and the Iraqis so, have yeah. tried to do some But there has been uh, nothing has been, it's been three days. Well, they've been trying. It's a very difficult operating environment. So again, we have a situation there where there is an incredibly uh, dire humanitarian you, situation and we're looking yeah. at what more we can do to help in a very urgent way. Are you, I mean, um, if I go on the whitehouse.gov, I can pull up a lot of statements in which uh, the United States has said that it's committed to the security and stability of Kurdistan mm -hmm. and Iraq as well. Mm -hmm. Is Are you repeating that? Are you committed to the security of Kurdistan region? Absolutely. We're committed to the security of the Kurdistan region. We're committed to the security of all of Iraq. That's why we are so deeply engaged here. That's why, again, today, I guarantee you there are many, many meetings going on in this building and elsewhere about what more we can do. Uh, we're looking at it in a very serious way. How prominent is the discussion of uh, providing material, uh, military materiel as opposed to providing uh, U.S. Uh, troop assistance? Well, I'm not going to outline any specific options, sort of take on or off the table any specific options. Uh, I think you've heard the President in the past speak about the fact that anything we do, first of all, anything we do has to be accompanied by a political uh, moves in Iraq. We've seen some moves toward government formation, but we need to see a prime minister named as soon as possible. That there's no American military solution here. Obviously, also talked about the principle of no combat troops on the ground. He's outlined those in a variety of ways throughout the past few weeks. So those are sort of, I think, 
part of how uh, decisions are made, but obviously no decisions to talk about yet. Call me, call me stupid, but why does it matter whether there's a new PM or whether Maliki is still in power? Well, we've said that a new government needs, because there's been an election, first of all, and there needs to be a new government in place. And so we have a, a COR speaker, we have a president, and the next step in that process is a prime minister. We have said one needs to be appointed as soon as possible uh, and to govern in an inclusive way. So there are consequences to elections, and we want to see them carried out here. But, uh, but ISIL could uh, continue its advance. It could uh, turn on the Yazidis. It could turn on the Christian minority. It already it, has. Uh, well, it could, it could step it up. That's it, true. And it, and it could actually That's why attack we need the a government strong in Mosul government formed and in, in Erbil, Baghdad so. that will work with the Kurdish regional government, as, we, as, the Baghdad, uh, as folks in Baghdad have done for many years now, to increase their coordination and cooperation as they fight this threat together. But that's a key part of it, is getting a strong, inclusive government in place. But trying to uh, work out the uh, logistics of installing a new government in the central, uh, in, in Baghdad, seems to be more of a priority, if you're stating this correctly, than it is with dealing with the security issue not in the northern all. third of the country. I, I'm not at all. Look, we can do more than one thing at a time. We believe they go hand in hand. That's why even while there hasn't been a new government in place, we've continued to up our assistance to the Iraqis throughout these past few weeks. We provided, you know, we put more ISR coverage in place. We provided these assessment teams. We did X, Y, and Z all while there was still government formation happening. So this has been an ongoing process, but they need to step up to the plate and uphold their end of the process as well. Is, is there any plan to send heavy arms to the Peshmerga? I don't have any, you know, I don't want to take any, any, uh, 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 you know, options on or off the table. Um, we're looking at what more ways we could help on that. Does that include military formation mm -hmm. question? I think the PM selection is supposed to happen like 15 days after the president's. So we're right in that window. We're right in the window. So, and I know the CR I met today and I think didn't name someone, so they need to do so as soon as possible. What's the U.S. assessment of this? I mean, is Brett McGurk still here? Is he in Baghdad? Is he, he is here in Washington. Um, uh, Ambassador B. Croft is in Baghdad. We've had folks, I mean, constantly on the phone with people. Uh, you know, nobody uh, knows this issue better than Brett McGurk, and so we've had a number of senior people very, very engaged on it. And we, and we look, we think they're going to get there. We just want to underscore the urgency with which we think they should do so. So does this, though, broadly speaking, was what, what's happening on the ground with ISIL complicate the government formation process, or does it in some ways perhaps expedite it by creating leverage here with the U.S. saying, w we can't help you until you follow through? Well, I don't think it's, it's leverage. I think it should create, particularly among the Iraqis, a sense of urgency that, you know, political squabbles are what they are, but we need to get a government in place that can deal with this in a united way. So I think that was more the word I would use is urgency. Any, yes, what else on Iraq? Iraq? Uh, Iraq? Okay. Is, is there any consideration the on refugee policy, how this would affect refugee policy? What was the discussion? The, the refugee policy? Well, Could we're, there be any changes in we're that? certainly looking, I mean, obviously, no changes to outline, but there's certainly been an, a huge number of internally displaced people already. We know this is a huge humanitarian crisis. Um, there's a very large refugee crisis in the region writ large, as we know, mainly from Syria, uh, but from other issues as well. So obviously that's one of the reasons we want to see what else we can do to help here. Yes, please. Uh -huh. Without making any announcement, do you, how do you see the, re, I mean, the situation there? Because as we can say from the reports that there's a lot of information floating there, uh, that there is new realities are shaped over Iraq, which, which is like the spread of ICI, ISIL, all over the place, and okay, they are not coming to Baghdad, but they are a lot of places. So what you see, how do you see the situation? Is this, okay, uh, you mentioned, for example, that it's a humanitarian crisis, mm -hmm. but from your understanding, from your assessment, from the team that they are there, mm -hmm. all these things they are, you are doing, do you see that there is a confrontation to stop this ISIL Spread? Right. It's not just a humanitarian crisis. I mean, that's certainly a key piece of particularly what we've seen over the last 48 hours, certainly. But there's a huge security challenge. If you talk about the Mosul Dam, if you talk about other places, ISIL is a threat not just because they kill innocent civilians because of their religion, but because they're a huge security threat uh, to the stability of certain parts of Iraq. And that's why throughout this conflict, uh, you have seen us continue to ramp up our support and continue to look very urgently at other things we could do uh, to help fight this threat. Because at the end of the day, we can help the Iraqis, but the Iraqis also have to stand up. They have to pull themselves together uh, with our help because this is the threat uh, that certainly they, but no one else in the region wants to see grow anymore. I'm, I'm trying to understand, okay, I understand and mm -hmm. I, that you are understanding the threat, but the reality is changing. I mean, 
this is this is the thing that all reports are saying that borders are sh changing people are displaced churches are burned whatever houses are occupied all these things are real or not real no they're they're real but look that's not the reality we want to see so where there are people displaced we want to help the iraqis so they can do things so people can return to their homes now this is a really tough fight this is a incredibly tough challenge in part because of the sheer brutality of ISIL that we've seen uh, over the past several months. So we don't want this to be the reality. That's why we're so engaged here and why we're looking to do more. Are military airstrikes being considered? Uh, again, I'm not going to put any option on the table or take any off. So that means they are then. They're part That's of the not mix. at all what I said. You can misread my words. But what I said is I'm not going to put any options on the table or take any off. Uh, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, again, we're looking at a, a range of options, and if and when we make decisions, uh, I'm sure we'll talk more if about If everything's them. being included, that would include I didn't say it. everything's being included. I said I am not publicly going to put any on the table or take any off. There's a difference, yes. Do, do, do you also agree that if, you, if the United States doesn't take action um, fast, that could, the situation would be really wor well, much worse? Let's be clear. We've already taken some action here to help uh, stem I mean, the military action against ISIL. If you don't take military action, the situation could be much worse, like Syria. I, I, look, I, I'm not going to get into any hypotheticals here. We're considering a range of options. I'm not going to detail them here. Um, but we are committed to seeing what we can do to help in the situation here. And I just probably don't have much more for you all than that on this. I know there okay. are lots of questions. Can but I ask you like another question? You can. As, as long as we are working in another group that we cannot talk to them, are you considering any time to talk to ISIL? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. I mean, I can check, but not to my knowledge. Or through other party? Well, certainly we talked to regional partners about the threat from ISIL, because it's not just a threat the Iraqis face, it's a threat that others face as well. Anything else on Iraq? Yes. Okay, moving on. Go ahead. Do you have anything on the uh, report that a uh, Korean-American was held by the Chinese authority near the border city between China and DPRK. I yes. Go ahead. No, no, no. Continue. Go ahead. Yeah, he's running a Christian NGO, and he, he has been interrogated by the Chinese authority. I just wonder if you have any more substance or details on this particular case. We, we are aware of those reports, but unfortunately, um, because of privacy considerations, I can't comment any further. I can't comment any further in any way. Does the United States see uh, counselor? Uh, access to this particular U.S. citizen? Well, I can't comment in any way on any specific cases. Obviously, we care very deeply about the safety and, and welfare of U.S. citizens all over the world and would provide consular access uh, when needed, in mm -hmm. general. Uh-huh. Uh, Geji Sheng, the human rights mm -hmm. lawyer, has been released. Uh, yes, and we welcome that news. Uh, <laughs> what's your assessment of his situation right now? Well, I don't have much more of an assessment here. We have welcomed the news that, that he was released today upon completion of his sentence. Also continue to urge China to release all prisoners of conscience. There are still a number that are in prison uh, and uphold their commitments to respect and protect the human rights uh, of all of their people. Uh, we also urge Chinese authorities to allow him to leave China to be reunited with his family in the United States if he so chooses. Do, do you know if there have been communications with the Chinese side about his case? specifically in the past couple of days? Uh, I can check. I don't know the answer to that. On China? Um, well, let's stay on China, Chinese, and then I'll go to Elise. Yeah. Uh, Chinese authority is planning to build a uh, five uh, I mean, lighthouse on five islands in the disputed waters in the South China Sea. Do mm -hmm. you, what is your take on that? Do you think it's a defiant? Well, we've said for a very long time that we believe territorial disputes um, should be managed and resolved peacefully, diplomatically, and in accordance with international law. Uh, for this reason, we support efforts that lower tensions and expand space for peaceful and diplomatic re resolutions of disputes. Uh, look, ideally, claimant states, uh, when there are disagreements, would decide among themselves what type of specific activities are considered provocative or out of bounds, um, offer to put a voluntary freeze on any such actions if other claimants would commit to do so likewise. I know this is going to be a topic of conversation in general at the upcoming ASEAN summit, uh, the Code of Conduct particularly. Um, but no more specific comment than that. Uh -huh. Another China related. Uh, uh -huh. the, after the, um, the U.S. Africa summit, meanwhile, we heard that the Chinese government is actually inviting the United States to work with China to uh, engage or to, to work together on a project. It's a hydroelectric dam project in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Hmm. What's your take that. on that? I'm happy to check. I hadn't seen sure. that. Yes, thank you.
Thank you. Elise. Um, can we talk about um, Gaza for a minute? Yeah. What's your understanding mm -hmm. of the attempts to extend a ceasefire and, and what the U.S. Uh, yes. team is doing? And, and on a, a related note, um, there are some reports that the Israelis are asking the U.S. delegation on the ground for help in ensuring that Israel is not referred to the International Criminal Court on War Crimes. Well, I haven't, I haven't heard that last part. But on the first part, um, the ceasefire is still in place. It's expiring soon. So uh, Acting Special Envoy Frank Lowenstein arrived in Cairo yesterday, August 6th, as part of our efforts to assist in the negotiations uh, regarding the situation in Gaza. Uh, his role in this process is to monitor progress and advise in areas where the U.S. can be helpful. In, achieve a last, in achieving a lasting ceasefire and forging a sustainable long-term solution for Gaza. He will not be involved in direct mediation between the delegations. Obviously, Hamas is a designated foreign terrorist organization. And we don't have direct contact with Hamas officials. Uh, Secretary Kerry also continues to be engaged with, uh, at the leader level with the key stakeholders. So this is part of a process. Obviously, what we need to see is a longer-term ceasefire put in place. And if Frank can help and our team there can help and Secretary Kerry can help, by making phone calls, we are absolutely there to do so. Um, I have a related kind of follow-on question. Mm -hmm. um, there are some reports about this UNRWA school um, that has like this summer camp mm -hmm. where um, Palestinian children are taught, um, you know, to hate Jews and to, uh, they call it Camp Jihad, that they're kind of taught about Jihad. And since U.S. taxpayer dollars do go to mm -hmm. um, UNRWA, I'm wondering if you've been notified of this, are you investigating? I've seen those reports, and our folks are looking into it. They didn't have any clarity for me when I came out here, but I'll follow up with them because I obviously, look, we, any, any anti-Semitic language, any, any uh, uh, language like that really just has no place in the discourse about this or any other issue. So let me check on the specifics. I had no confirmation of that before I came out. Yes, You're saying that he's not directly involved. Uh, in, in direct, he's not involved in direct mediation between the delegations. In other words, he's not talking directly to Hamas. Certainly, he's not direct, talking directly to Hamas. Is he dealing with the Israelis and the Egyptians? Certainly. Is he in talks. Mm -hmm. He's. I mean, he's not. You know, in every meeting, but he's there on the ground talking to them. And yes, what's the United yes, States' understanding of the 48-hour um, extension of the ceasefire that the Israelis have agreed to? But. Well, it's my understanding that obviously the ceasefire is still in place and will be expiring sure, soon and that there's no extension that's yet been uh, put in place. That's my understanding. Again, things are changing minute by minute, probably change since I came out here. Yes, I'm going to go here and then back to you. The, uh, the family of uh, Tariq Abu Qadir, the 15-year-old the boy who was mm -hmm. beaten in American uh, Palestinian, detained in Israel, uh, was here meeting with senior officials on Friday, they tell me. And they raised a case, uh, two cases of two other American teenage boys who are in detention, uh, Muhammad Abu Nai and Muhammad Abu Qadir, same name, different person of the of the team that was killed. Do you have any details have about what? Yeah, and I can't confirm the part about them being here on Friday. I'm happy to check. I just don't have that in front of me. Um, I can confirm that Muhammad uh, Abu Nye, I think that's how you say that, or Nai, uh, is a U.S. citizen. Was arrested on July 3rd during protests in the um, Shuafat neighborhood in East Jerusalem. He is currently being held in a youth section of a prison there. The U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv is providing consular assistance. A consular officer visited him on July 31st and attended his hearing on July 22nd. The embassy is also in frequent contact with Muhammad's family and his lawyer. Uh, we are calling for a speedy resolution to this case. This 15-year-old has now been held for five weeks in Israeli custody and are gravely concerned over the prolonged detention of this U.S. citizen child. He does have a lawyer working on his behalf as well. In terms of the other name, uh, we've, look, we've encouraged family members of any U.S. citizens who are being detained to immediately contact the U.S. Consulate General in Jerusalem. I can't confirm, and our folks could not confirm, that there was another U.S. citizen by that name being held. So we'll check, but we just couldn't confirm that. For it's a housekeeping issue. Why um, is the embassy in Tel Aviv um, working on this guy's case and not the, uh, the uh, Consul General in Jerusalem? Uh, which one? The first one? Why yeah. is the embassy in Tel Aviv providing consular assistance? And not the it may consul be, general. Uh, the answer is I don't know. It may be where he's being held in the prison. It may be because we're working with the Israelis. I'm just not sure. Now, you've been talking to the Israelis about this for several weeks. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, why are they not releasing him? Well, look, our role here is to ensure that he is afforded due process under local laws and the protections required by international law and do want a speedy resolution to this case. We are concerned, I, I think I said gravely, about the fact that he is still in custody. But what are the, uh, and the fact that he's a minor, mm -hmm. 
how does that affect what the U.S. government can do on his behalf? Are there added levers that can be used? I don't know if legally it impacts anything. Obviously, we are always concerned if a U.S. citizen is custody in, in custody, particularly the prolonged detention of a child, I think we would say. I don't know if that's legal, but that's just sort of a policy. And can you say how frequently uh, people have been able to see him, given his age? Uh, are they able to assess the uh, conditions in which he's being held? I can find out if the, the frequency. Uh, we are concerned about allegations that he has been mistreated while in custody. We take all these allegations seriously and have raised our concerns with the appropriate authorities. Um, uh, can I just, you know, broaden this out a little bit? You are giving the Israelis, and you've said from this podium, an extraordinary amount of mm -hmm. assistance, um, military aid. Um, you're taking it on the chin for them at the United Nations. I mean, you're doing a lot for the um, Israelis you know, uh, across the board all the time, but specifically in this conflict. And are you um, frustrated that you're not getting, um, you know, a, a quick redress to this one 15-year-old kid who's been um, in, in, uh, in Israeli jail and, as you have you said, about in, under concerning circumstances? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, I think, and also to your first point, though, Elise, we've also stood at this podium made very clear when we've had issues with the things Israel's done during this. So let's, we've yeah, done I both. Understand. But we've done both. Um, but on this, yes, I said we are gravely concerned that there hasn't been a speedy resolution, and we want there to be. So we'll continue raising it and continue pushing. We believe there needs to be due process here under local laws, obviously. But we do think there should be a, a quick resolution. Well, here. do you think there needs to be some kind of more reciprocal relationship with that? When obviously, like Israel has a lot of security needs that you need mm -hmm. to address, and that it's a very long-standing policy of the U.S. to help. But do you find that when you have issues about your own security or issues about your own citizens, that they're addressed in the same manner? Well, we can do more than one thing at once, and those things aren't mutually exclusive. We will continue. Um, our security relationship because we believe it's important, but we've also we're very clear when there are things like this that arise that we have very deep concerns about. We can do both at the same time, and we are. I didn't say you can't do both at the same time, but do you feel that Israel is doing both at well, the same time? We're certainly pushing them too. What else, Deb? I just want to go back to the uh, the talks on Iran. Do you have any specific mm -hmm. readout that you can give us about the meeting that Wendy Sherman and, and Burns and company had with the Iranian officials today? Uh, it was, I would say, a constructive discussion. You've heard me use that word before. Um, another step in the process here, we're not going to, I think, get into details of that. As I said, uh, we are now in the extension phase of the Joint Plan of Action, and there will be a host of different kinds of meetings throughout this process, whether it's bilaterals that all the countries have with Iran, not just us, uh, experts meetings to work through the very technical issues, and plenary sessions. And Part of this will be around the General Assembly, as it was last year, and we're just going to keep having meetings and trying to make progress. Marie, I'm sorry, I might have missed this, mm -hmm. but did you just say that there was consular access and when it was given uh, with Mohammed? Are we Muhammad? back on with who? Mohammed. Yes, Amina. I did. I said that. Hold on. Go back here. Uh, we, yes. A consular official visited him on July 31st and attended his hearing on July 22nd. The embassy also is in frequent contact with his family and his lawyer. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh -huh. Regarding the team, and you mentioned with um, uh, Deputy Secretary Burns that his status is going to be a special government employee. Mm -hmm. It's this a technical term. term. It see? is. It's a technical term. Okay. Yeah. For him and for other persons. For Jake Sullivan. Yeah. Yep. I know there's there's been a lot of questions given yeah, their mean, role I in mean, the talks. If once they it, leave their this, current this, positions, this, they this will title still work on is this. to to be specific for this. For these uh, negotiations. Not for other things. Correct. Correct. Deputy Secretary Burns and and uh, the Vice President's National Security Advisor Jake so Sullivan we, have been very involved in the Iran negotiations and. Since we have an extension and each of them will be leaving their current positions, uh, Jake actually fairly soon, uh, they will remain just in that capacity as part of the Iran talks. Yes, uh, Ali. Oh, just one more. Let's go to uh, Ali, please. Ross, let's go to Ali. Um, on Russia, uh -huh. uh, do you have any comment on the uh, sanctions that Putin's announcing on food products, uh, I believe in the United States and other mm -hmm. countries that have imposed sanctions on Russia? Well, I think it's. I mean, look, the bottom line here is President Putin is denying his own people food. And I'm not sure how he's going to sell that at home. But not only is he running their economy into the ground, and their growth is now predicted at zero, um, but he's also denying them basic things like food. 
Uh, and sadly, look, it's going to be the Russian people who will suffer as a result of his actions. And we've always said um, that this is, it's the Russian people who are, who are hurting more than anyone here, after the Ukrainian people, I would say. Um, and so he has a choice to make. Either he can take actions that hurt his own people, or he can use the uh, diplomatic off-ramp that we've always said exists and, and de-escalate and try to move forward in a different direction here. Yes. Do you have any estimation or expect any losses for American uh, exports of chicken because uh, Russia is, uh, I mean, second uh, largest market for U.S. chicken? We are studying the decision and what impact it would have on U.S. business. Um, look, these measures, A, would no doubt adversely affect the Russian economy. Um, one way we think that will happen is they will push up Russia's already high inflation rate and also erode the purchasing power of Russian citizens. So if this is intended to hurt us, I think it's pretty clear that it will actually hurt the Russians. Look, we're looking at it right now. Do you, do you think uh, this uh, can be disputed in WTO? Um, I haven't heard that. I'm happy to check with our team. There's a really easy way it could get resolved, though, and that's Russia de-escalating here. Yes. Yes, please. Uh -huh. Regarding this issue, there is a report in British press about the deal, gas deal or oil deal between Russia and Iran. Uh, yes. I do you have any comment I about do, it? I do, and I think those, report, those reports have been out for a long time, and quite frankly, many but of them are erroneous. Guardian, I think. There's a new one out, yeah. We've seen the reports of this, that there was some MOU signed between Russia and Iran, agreeing to further talks in September on a variety of economic and trade issues. Um, look, there's been a lot of rumors out there about this deal. It's still unclear whether this oil for goods deal has progressed in any substantial way. Um, if it were to move forward, this would obviously raise serious concerns and could be potentially sanctionable. Being in Geneva and other places mm -hmm. with Iran, did you raise this issue at any time? Um, we've certainly raised it, I believe, with the Russians uh, and also with the Iranians, I believe. But I can double check on that. Yes. Roz, did you have another one? Uh, yeah, just a final one on uh, Gaza. How worried is the U.S. that if the ceasefire is not extended that we will see fighting again, uh, given that uh, Hamas's military wing is threatening to uh, start firing whatever it has left in its arsenal? Well, I think we are very concerned that without an additional ceasefire, there will be more bloodshed on both sides. I think we are. Yes. Uh, I apologize if I missed it when I was coming and going, but were you asked about reports of a U.S. citizen possibly being detained near the uh, North Korean border? I was, and I said I'm aware of the reports and don't have any further comment due to privacy. Thanks. Uh, briefly, uh, I saw that Secretary Kerry made a statement on Cambodia on the Cambodia trials. Uh, just to pursue that, he was talking about continued support for the tribunal. Do you have any ideas of what the U.S. support is now and uh, how that would change or not change? I don't, um, but it's a good question. Let me ask. Anything else, guys? Down? I have a real minor one here okay. about... Um, I always Arge hesitate when people say that. Well, it might not be minor to <laughs> Argentina, but um, okay. Argentina is challenging some U.S. court decisions at the World Court. Okay, I haven't seen that. And uh, we need to know if the U.S. thinks the World Court has jurisdiction over this issue. Okay, let me check. Okay. Yes, um, Margaret. In Geneva, will uh, Secretary, Deputy Secretary Burns or anyone on the U.S. delegation raise the issue of the jailed Washington Post reporter? We always raise the American citizens who are detained in Iran, and we did this time as well. Okay. Yes. That's it. I want to point out, I forgot to mention at the beginning, guys, I'm sorry. We have some interns from DRL, right? Take your head if I'm right, in the back of the briefing. So I should have done it at the top, but thank you for coming. My first job here was as an intern at the State Department, so... Look, you could be up here someday. Um, but thanks for coming and, uh, and putting up with all of us. So I usually do that at the top. Uh, anything else, guys? Great, thank you.